All right, you may turn to Luke chapter 13. We continue on a journey. And to there's many ways to start this uh, passage, which ends up, it's going to be like an onion. You know, I, as I was looking at that, I said, man, I could spend the whole time on this one verse. But man, the next verse has so much. And oh, he's going there. And that, that's, uh, that's a whole topic by itself. So I'm not even sure how far I'm going to get. But we do need to start on where in the world we're at. So I want you to start with me in verse 22. We're just going to look at that, and then I'm going to turn to two other passages. And he was passing through, in verse 22, from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. Now, we're going to turn back to Luke 9, verse 51, because I've made it a point and referenced it many times, where it says in 951, And it came about when the days were approaching for his ascension that he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. Hmm. And so they do, and then they get there, and then in 13... Uh, verse 22, and they were passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. Uh -huh. Now turn with me to chapter 18, Luke 18, verse 31. And Jesus took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished, and so on. So what is Luke doing? To me, what Luke has done, and I'm still digesting these things, but it's almost like a tide where in 951 the tide comes up and there's things that he wishes for us to encounter with Jesus as he then gets to Jerusalem and things begin to happen and then the tide recedes, and now we're back in chapter 13 with moving forward on his journey to Jerusalem, and then we're going to encounter things, and then it recedes, and we get to chapter 18, where the tide is now coming up, and it's like, okay, we're now, and there's no more of that, so now we are going to be once again in Jerusalem. Is that three different times he was in Jerusalem, or is it Luke's way of telling that there obviously something huge going to happen in Jerusalem because it's, it's kind of pointing in that direction, and then it's like we're there, but then Luke recedes and then proceeds again. It's almost as if, uh, I mean, I could go back now and, and share a little bit. I already mentioned that Kathy is in Clovis this morning. I could share, you know, some of the things that happened and the th things we ate and the, so on and so forth. Uh, and then at the end of the sermon, I could revisit that and give you more, uh, which I'm not going to do. So what we have here then in chapter 13, starting in verse 22 is the picture, and if you can picture Israel, uh, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan, Perea, that Jesus was ministering in Galilee, and then he proceeded. At one point, he sends the 70 out, and they're going to be over here on the eastern side of the Jordan. They're going to be ministering. Uh, and announcing the kingdom of God is coming. And of course, then Jesus shows up, who himself is the king of the kingdom, and therefore the kingdom is there. And that's, in a sense, where we are at this time. We are over in Perea. As we can see, he's going from one city and village to another, teaching. And what he's doing, as the Greek says, he's, he's uh, doing a journey unto Jerusalem. He's doing a journey unto Jerusalem. Uh, to me, it is the journey, because everything in Jesus' life and ministry, the purpose and so on, is going to be fulfilled in Jerusalem with all the things that he is going to say 
in uh, Luke 18, verse 32, but we've already seen twice given in previous chapters where he's told the disciples, I must go there, I must be treated poorly by the leadership, I must suffer death, suffer and die, but don't worry, I'm going to rise again on the third day. Um, so that's where we're at. So he brings us to a place where we once again, now we're back, the tide has receded, now we're in Perea, and we're on our way to Jerusalem. So there's going to be things here, including the parables and the stories, that he wishes to, as I would say, the hourglass is squeezing down, and the closer it gets, the more pressure there is. So we've already been there, in a sense, in the previous chapters, from 951, and now we're back up here again, and we're going to squeeze once again. And it seems to me, as you can tell by the uh, title on the page, entrance into Christ's kingdom is limited. Uh, we've had a similar question, what we're going to see, in fact, I'm going to read it right now in verse 23. Uh, someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? Now that question reminds me of something that was asked back in chapter 10, verse 25, where a certain lawyer in 1025 stood up and put Jesus to the test saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That is a question innate in every person that exists. Why do you think certain people grab their wheels and spin them? And certain people don't eat cows. And certain people, if they kill Christians, you know, they get, what is it, 70 virgins for the eternity? Uh, what are they doing? Well, they're seeking eternal life. That's what they're doing. So the concept of life uh, and we could have a discussion on cryogenics, um, you know, taking pieces of me and wait, hoping that one day I'll be Mr. Cyborg, president of the world. I mean, people do a number of things to try to gain or keep eternal life. So it's somewhere in there, someone says, is, are there only, Lord, are there only a few who are being saved. Is salvation a limited commodity? Don't you think that's a good question? I mean, only those that attend, and this is some church's statement, but only those that attend this church are truly saved. <laughs> there are churches that say that which puts you and I at odds because uh, we don't belong to that church. So why are we even here? So it's a valid question. We ate. Remember that time we uh, had potluck together? Remember that? Uh, we drank. Remember we, uh, there was a little bit of coffee left over and we shared it? Remember? Remember? And then remember uh, that service on October... 10th, 2021. I, I attended your service. Remember that? That's what, that's what they're saying. They were saying we were in proximity to you. How far away from you were we? We were in your presence. I remember I sat right there. Oh, that's where Kathy sits. Sorry. I sat right there because nobody sits there. <laughs> I sat right there. Obviously, if one of you sat there, I would notice. <laughs> I sat right there. Where are you from? Well, we're from your presence. And we're from where you were teaching. But I'll tell you this, something more than presence is required. Outward contact means nothing. And I go back and I think of those many, and they were all ages, old, young, male, female, 
that I've spoken to in the past, shared Christ. Told you. I already told you. Because you keep talking to me about this stuff. I told you I prayed the prayer. Oh, was it ten words? Five words? A hundred words? So. So, nothing is uh, valuable with regards to simply the outward contact. Um, so, verse 27. And he will say to you, I do not know whence you are or where you are from. By the way, that I did not know, that's a perfect tense. I didn't know then. I don't know now, and guess what? I'm still not going to know in another 24 hours. That's what that says. So, he has something to say in verse 27. I tell you, I tell you, I know not whence you are. Depart from me. Stand away from me. All workers of and this word um, is uh, not a not a not a good word. It's uh, without righteousness. So it's all workers of injustice, all workers of wrong, all workers of iniquity, falsehood, deceitfulness, unrighteousness. All those things work. And it's not like, boy, I sure wish I could only be the first one and not the last one because it's really bad. No, they're all bad. They're all without righteousness. They're all workers who work in the realm of unrighteousness, of iniquity. And that's what he calls all those, those even eating with him. Those even listening to him. Again, and I've said this before, I, I said it on uh, Tuesday night, this is heartbreaking. This is heartbreaking. And it's heartbreaking for any shepherd who stands in the pulpit and realizes, having bathed the word in prayer and concept and commitment to the Lord and realize that the responsibility here is to portray truth accurately because if it's not truth portrayed inaccurately, it isn't truth. So it comes out here and it lands in your ears. And it's like the uh, Pacheco ball. It goes in and... Do -do 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 Does it hit the right place? It has to hit some place. We could go back to the word struggle to make sure you enter by the narrow gate. So he says, and it's a command, get away from me. Stand apart from me, stand away from me, leave me, all workers of unrighteousness. He describes where they're supposed to stand in verse 28. There shall be the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth. When you see, and you will see, there's a, there's a uh, absolute horrific concept here of the unjust workers or the workers of injustice, the workers of iniquity and so on, seeing Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. They get to see. It's like watching the train that's, uh, or the bus that's uh, heading off to uh, some amusement park or the beach, beach party, or something huge, and you're standing there watching the bus leave. It's like you, you get to watch what you missed. Weeping, the weeping, and the gnashing of the teeth, when you shall see with your own eyes these men in the past, obviously Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets, 
this is where we could spend time, and we're not going to spend much time, but recognize that for a Jewish listener, there's, there's, their whole heritage begins with these patriarchs. Abraham the father, Isaac his only son, Jacob the one whose uh, name was changed to Israel, the name by which now the whole nation is known, and all the prophets. We uh, have mentioned in the past uh, the prophets in the Old Testament. They're the, they're the uh, loudspeakers of God. God speaks to them and they speak it out. Uh, a responsibility that, in a sense, the, uh, uh, the pastor, the, the, the teacher uh, has, though we teach this. We don't... We don't teach, oh, by the way, God told me this morning, and then uh, this has happened to pastors point to a person, God told me this morning. It's like, oh. Uh, um, it doesn't anger me much. Um, these prophets of God are listed alongside the head and the heads of who they are as a people. So we, we read that whole thing from 27 through 28. And he, the, the one who shut the door, will tell you, who? You. I don't know where you are from. But obviously you are not from this family, which means you don't belong here. Get away from me all workers of iniquity, there shall be the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth when you shall see your nation in the kingdom of God. What about you? Where are you? That's the rest of verse 28. You yourselves being thrown outside. Picture that however you want. Some of the old westerns where, you know, there's the saloon and all of a sudden the Saloon door is open, and out comes this guy sailing out. That's this. You don't get to enter in. So the outward proximity means nothing. Denial of, uh, of, of you by the house manager means pain and suffering. However, a responsive heart to Jesus is what God is seeking. Obviously, uh, a passage like this, we're, we're going to actually be able to finish. I see that now. Verses 29 and 30 we'll get to in just a moment. But uh, These things make me sit back. If you think I'm just this, uh, I don't know what you think of me, but arrogant parader of pride walking around my living room saying, God, thank you so much that I get to share this and I want to pound the people with this. It's so good of you to let me do that. It's like, dear Lord, is he, is he not speaking to me when he says, make sure, struggle to get in through the narrow door? Lord, have I done that? And then to go back and say, well, let's see, what does he really say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Do I believe? Well, I testify to it that I do. Um, and and all, the, all the verses that, uh, that he gives on salvation and, and faith placed in Jesus. Uh, as I've told my unsaved friend, who to this day still has not accepted, you're either in or you're out. You're either on the inside or you're on the outside. And to be on the inside is so hard. Lord, I accept your sacrifice of Jesus on my behalf. Thank you. Of course, it's said by faith. It's not, I prayed the prayer. I prayed what Lindbeck told me to pray. I'm saved. Yay. It's not how it works. So we, are, we move from the figure of the, uh, of the narrow and soon shut door that is to say, 
it's a narrow entrance. Many want to do other things than what Jesus said. Um, where was I? Somebody just shared with me this week. Oh, it was uh, Monday night. I was, uh, Kathy and I had dinner with uh, two other couples um, before we saw that movie, Ends of the, Ends of the World. And uh, Michael shared with me that the pastor that morning had said, remember, there's two ways to get to heaven. <laughs> and he said, I would have got up and walked out, but I had invited friends to church, and they were sitting right there, so I couldn't just leave them there. Um, yeah. Uh, so we get to the conclusion in verse, uh, or, or the, the second part, um, in verses 29 and 30. And this, the figure changes. And it went from, uh, well, it could be an extension of, of what we just said. So this is how it reads in 29 and 30. And they shall come from the east and the west, and from the north and the south, and shall recline at table in the kingdom of God, and behold, there are last who shall be first, and there are first who shall be last. So keep in mind that all of this is uh, being shared with Jews, so they would be tuned into this. I need to say that because that helps explain verse 30. But the, uh, the nations will be blessed at, uh, at God's table. There's the world, in essence, is going to be invited to eat dinner with God in God's kingdom. That's crazy. To recline at table is to eat. That's what it is. So they're coming from all over, and they get to sit down, and this is in the kingdom of God. That which those who... Uh, desire to obtain entrance, stand outside and knock, but the door's already been shut, so it's too late. So it's like, well, you don't get to recline at table. Even though from all over the world, there's those who are going to get to come. We get to the last verse. Behold, let me read it in the Greek. And behold, there are... Those, there are uh, last ones, the ones who shall be first, and there are first ones, the ones who shall be last. That's how it reads. So who are these first and who are these last? Well, the uh, last ones are those who are furthest from the kingdom, from God's grace. And we consider, uh, because we've already read the story uh, back in, I think, chapter 7, chapter 8, um, the Romans were Gentiles, and the Romans basically were bad people, and, uh, and they were the rulers of the land. And yet we find this centurion who loved Jehovah God, paid for the synagogue that these people worshipped in, and he, he understood uh, Jesus' uh, authority and responded to that. So he would be a last one. He was furthest from the grace of God, and yet Jesus said the last ones are the ones who will be first. There are last ones who will be first. So where is that centurion, let's say, standing next to Caiaphas? Caiaphas, remember Caiaphas? One of the guys that made sure Jesus hung on the cross, chief priest, big dude in Judaism, centurion, way down here, last in the eyes of the Jews, and yet where is he? Well, he's up here. He's invited to the table. Where's Caiaphas? Well, he's going to be the second part, those who are first. Caiaphas, where is he? He's in the temple. When? About every day. Where is he? Well, he's going to be last. And where's last? Last is further from God, furthest from God's grace. 
this statement in verse 30, some are last who will be first and some first who will be last, is a, such a sad indictment for those who are close but close gets you nothing. First are those most favored and close to God. And Jesus says, hey, look, there are ones farthest, the ones who will be first, and there are the most favored ones who will be last. And uh, the present tense, I believe, is the present time for them and the present conditions. There are those right now. As I'm talking to you, Jesus says. The future tense is eventual condition outside the kingdom. So uh, all those that have had close proximity to God again and again. Let me, let me tell you this, that especially those in the United States, not necessarily those in Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan, but even in Indonesia, there were in the hotbed where I was, um, the hotbed of, of Islamic jihadism in, in the um, Far East, uh, Banda Aceh, even there, there were churches. So how guilty are those who are in proximity to the gospel and yet never respond? One day, Eh, when I'm old and gray, for all those people that were little kids when they said, ah, Sunday school is for little kids and old people. Well, they're old people now. And Sunday school is still for somebody else. That's what they're saying. So what do we have here? We have a picture of God's grace extended to everyone. But the human condition says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The, the real response, the honest response is to bow the knee, knee before a sovereign God and acknowledge that you have an issue. And it's a sin issue which prevents you from his righteousness and his kingdom. That's what you need to do. And that's done by faith. It's an acknowledgement of my own condition. But what do most people do? They say, these are the rules that I make for God so that I can go to heaven. I'm going to be good enough. Shut up. You can never be good enough. By the way, there are two ways to get to heaven. One is through Jesus Christ and one is through your own righteousness. Whoops, okay, well, there's only one way, because <laughs> your own righteousness is already done. Anyway, uh, entrance into Christ's kingdom, we have to understand, is a narrow way. Yes, we are a religion that says not all roads lead to Rome. There's only one way God said to get to heaven. Jesus is the only way. And then to realize that it is our responsibility to look into the face of God and make sure that he knows who we are. And we do that by telling him, I know who you are. You are the God, the creator God, who sent your son to die on the cross on my behalf. Praise God, I believe that. Thank you for inviting me into your family. Father God, we uh, live in a bittersweet world. We live in a world where we recognize your grace and mercy has been extended to us. And it's, it's nearly unfathomable, in fact it probably is, to recognize that you chose to love me. You chose to choose me so that I could share eternity in your kingdom with you. Your mercy was extended to me as Jesus' blood was sufficient to die, to, to pay the price for my sin so I don't have to die. Lord, it's also bittersweet in the sense that there are so many who sit in proximity to the doors of a church. Some of them even sit inside the church. One woman played the organ for, I don't know, 30 years in the church, and she had no concept 
of your salvation. How sad. Father, may we indeed recognize the words of Jesus that talk specifically to us. Make sure, struggle, agonize, strive to make sure you have entered in through the narrow door. And that door is Jesus. So, Lord God, we commit our way to you this week. If we can possibly be a blessing to those who live in a dark, lost world, such that they might actually respond to the light, then give us that grace to do so. We love you and uh, rely upon you as we leave this place to give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.